Yeah, welcome everyone. Um, according to the notes that you wrote me after the last lecture, there were quite a few questions about the different growth regimes, ordered growth versus um, runaway growth. And um, since I will come back in this lecture a little bit to this, when I talk about pebble accretion, I would not like to go to so much detail at this point. You may ask some further questions. The point is, I mean, the questions were relating to the point under what circumstance we have what uh, growth condition. Yes, and the, re uh, the um, explanation is basically that uh, the numerical simulations tell you which, which type of growth you are in. I mean, you have to calculate the relative velocities of the particles, and this depends on the evolutionary state of the whole system. So it's calculated at each instance. You calculate basically the relative velocity of the particles at time and radius, and from this you can calculate the local time and radius dependent uh, enhancement factor, F graph, and from that you can calculate then going into the equation for the mass growth, then you can calculate uh, the uh, uh, growth of, of M with time. So it's not a, a pre, you can't say up an issue basically what regimes you will be in, so you have to do the whole simulation, then you can tell afterwards at what time you had the runaway growth and at what time you had the orderly growth. But later on I will come uh, to this point again and then we can maybe we can clarify a few other points in addition. So let me come to the formation of massive planets. And before I actually start, I will explain to you some concepts here, some basic ideas, which is different in ma with massive planets than it is with comparison to small mass planets. There are basically two formation scenarios for massive planets of Jupiter mass and larger, let's say. Okay? Uh, the left one, the so-called core accretion model, sometimes called core instability model, even though the core is never really unstable here. Nevertheless, it's used also frequently here. There you form first a core, which is embedded in the center of the planet, and this core is formed by the methods we have heard today in the morning. Exactly the way you form terrestrial planets, you form the cores of Jupiter-type planets in the same manner, only further out. And we have seen the isolation mass at the distance of Jupiter is about 10 Earth masses for typical parameters of the solar nebula, presumed parameters of the solar nebula. So you first, the, first you form the core and then you rapidly accrete the gas onto the core. So you have dust, planetesimals, protoplanets, and now we go to Jovian type planets here. If we have gas, or depending on the amount of gas you have, you can form Jupiter mass planets or you just only Uranian or you may remain a terrestrial planet. So this is this left part here, which is believed to be responsible for the formation of Jupiter in the solar system and maybe many other exosolar planets. And on the other side, you have the so-called gravitational instability or sometimes called disk instability model. There you have a direct collapse of little fragment in a gravitationally unstable disk that is a disk which has a sufficiently high mass, and it was outlined today in the morning by Phil, what this means, if it has a sufficiently high mass, it can condense directly and form massive self-gravitating objects, which then later on condense and co contract to massive planets. This is explained in detail in a later lecture seven, basically, and this mechanism which is responsible for producing these massive planets and the outer disk, the gravitation stability, is the same instability that can operate in principle on this very thin dust layer in the middle of the disk we have been talking about yesterday. So if the dust condenses to the mid-plane, the same instability condition, basically the tumbral criterion, which was outlined today in the morning, uh, applies, and you can then see whether such a condition will be unstable or stable, okay? which depends basically on the mass of this clump here and the temperature of the clump, the sound speed basically, and the rotation rate at that radius. So this will be heard uh, later on, I think on Friday actually. And today we'll look at the standard core accretion model 
for the solar system and probably many other extrasolar planets. So what is, is there some evidence that the planets in the solar system have cores? So if we talk about the core accretion scenario, we must think or believe that there are really cores in the center of Jupiter and Saturn, say. Okay? And for measurements of observations of mass, radius, gravitational moments, and surface abundances, you can infer something about the interior structure. I have paused a little bit with gravitational moments. I don't know whether this is so clear. This cannot be done from Earth. The other three points, mass, radius, you can measure, and surface abundance potentially also you can measure from Earth. To measure the gravitational moments, this is the deviation of a spherical uh, gravitational field. Okay, you fly with space probes to Jupiter. Jupiter is oblated, Jupiter rotates, so Jupiter is not spherical. This leads to a deviation of a spherical Newtonian potential. And by analyzing higher orders, if you make a Legendre expansion there, if you analyze higher moments there, you can infer something about the internal structure of Jupiter. And you can do, this gives you more information than just having mass and radius. Because mass and radius only give you basically the mean uh, density of the planet. And they don't tell you really exactly what the stratification inside of the planet will be. So from these observations here, one finds basically that for Jupiter, the inferred core masses range depending on the equation of state. So these are all different equations of state. But don't ask me any details on them. <laughs> I'm not able to answer them. So these are different equations, for example, for, the, for high pressure material that are s supposed to be in the center of Jupiter there. And there is inferred from experiments, m measurements, and so on. So you see the, the, the core mass ranges from zero to about something like 10 Earth masses. Okay, this is the core mass of Jupiter. And for Saturn, things are more clear. So Saturn has a, probably a core mass around 15, 10 to 15 Earth masses. Okay. And the problem for Jupiter is, of course, the core mass is only a very small fraction of the total mass of Jupiter. So the core is very small in comparison to the overall radius. So the errors in defining the core mass are huge. So it wouldn't surprise me if next year there's a paper that tells us that Jupiter has a core of 15 Earth masses. Okay? And there are some papers, in fact, saying that. So this, there's a huge range. These are just results by Somor and Guyot uh, from 2004. OK, so from observations, we know that Saturn, at least, and probably also Jupiter, have cores. So they have lots of solid material in them. And uh, they are enriched above solar quite a bit. So we believe that there's first a core formation, and then you have gas accretion. This is a picture by Phil here from his lecture notes. So first you have a core. Then the core forms a sort of atmosphere around it. The atmosphere is able to accrete additional planetesimals, which happen to come by close to the object there. So the core grows. And then suddenly, when the core has reached a certain mass, the so-called critical mass, I will come to that, then suddenly there is a rapid accretion of gas onto this core. This, that's why it is called sometimes core instability model, but it's basically an instability of the envelope. It should be called envelope instability model because the envelope is contracting very rapidly onto the core. Okay. And this is a runaway process. So the question is then, how long do these different phases take? Okay. And this is one of the major problems still in the giant planet formation process. Yes, because we have seen this phase can take quite long yeah, for the terrestrial planets until they're fully grown. We have seen it may take 100 million years. This would be too long. If this would take 100 million years here to form the core, of Jupiter, then there would be no gas left, and we couldn't do the gas accretion there. So we must have some other mechanisms here to speed it up. OK. Atmosphere accretion. I have a little argument here uh, from Phil's book here. Why, and under what conditions can a planet keep an atmosphere? OK. So we look, and the, the simplest condition is that the escape speed at the surface of the planet 
That means for a particle which is just near the, the uh, surface of the, uh, the planet. The escape speed must be larger than the local sound speed. That's an order of uh, estimate uh, here, order of magnitude here. So we can then calculate here the mass of the planet, the mean density of the planet, radius of the planet gives the mass here. I think there's a factor of power three missing here, okay? And then we have the escape speed, the standard relation here we have seen today already, and the sound speed is h over r times uk. And, and you notice one little thing here, the very careful reader sees that I denote the scale height with a capital H and fill with a lowercase h, okay? I hope this is no confusion. Lowercase uh, h is in my a formulation h over r, this would be lowercase h. So uh, you will, but you will not be confused. We are very uh, uh, observant here and, and will notice this, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so if we plug this all in, we can see that an icy body at 5 AU can keep something like, uh, will, be, will get a little atmosphere, very small fraction of the Earth mass. But this is not, let's say, a very good estimate. We would like to know when the atmosphere has a sizable fraction of a planet. So we introduce a parameter epsilon here, which gives you the mass of the envelope in terms of the mass of the total, of the total mass of the planet. So if epsilon, let's say we want it to be 0.1 for a reasonable estimate, and then we find that the planet mass must be larger than 0.2 Earth masses. Okay? Only then it can keep a significant envelope mass, okay? atmosphere mass. Okay. I apologize for all this text here, but it will be later very useful if you go through these notes, which I'm sure you do, yes, then you can read everything in more detail. Even now it's difficult to read everything at one hand, but later on you will appreciate this, I hope, if there's more text. <laughs> at least that's my belief, if more, there's more text here. So the red ones are more important than the other ones here. So at, at one AU here, you find epsilon point one, you find a planet of one Earth mass could sustain a significant envelope. But the Earth, as we see it now, has only very little atmosphere, you know, basically not present. If you compare it to the mass of the Earth, it's insignificant. Okay. Good. So then we have to take only read the red bit here. We have to consider the isolation mass, which we had already. Okay. Yeah, so the planet grows in time. Yes, and it can only accrete basically significant amount of of gas if the isolation mass is beyond a mass where it, the planet could accrete a significant amount of atmosphere. Okay? So we need a high enough isolation mass to get this atmosphere. Okay? Because this Earth mass was acquired in 10 to the 8 years where the disk was long gone. So the Earth could not get the atmosphere because there was no gas to get it from. Okay? So the concept of the, of the isolation mass is important here again. Only a planet which has reached the mass to attain a significant, uh, significant amount of atmosphere can actually get, must be beyond this isolation mass. Okay? The rest would just step on. So, what about the isolation mass? We haven't really mentioned, I think, the concept of the uh, ice line here. So the ice line is that line in the solar nebula. If you go from inside out, we have heard several times that the temperature is dropping in the disk and there will be a radius inside or outside of which ice can condense. Okay? Inside of that radius, ice is only in gaseous form. Okay? And that radius we call the snow line, sometimes called ice line. Okay? And that temperature is roughly, it depends on the pressure, of course, of the equation of state of water, vapor versus solid water, but rough numbers are 150, 170 Kelvin in the disk. And that temperature is reached for the solar nebula, I will come back to that, I will come to that next view graph, around 2.7 astronomical units. So beyond that, let's say at the distance of Jupiter definitely, ice was in condensed form. That means at that radius we had much more solids than we had inside of this. Because there's lots of water in the uh, uh, protoplanetary nebula here, and outside we can condense this water into solids, and inside it cannot condense. Okay. <clears throat> it just reminds me to the conditions here outside, so if the weather continues to be like this, all of this ice will not be anymore in the form of ice, but it will evaporate and go into the form of water vapor. 
So this is the snow line then here in, in Les Deplorés. So the snow line in the solar system is around 2.7 AU, which is this line here. And this is the surface density here of the uh, gas and the solids. The gas has this relationship, which is R to the minus uh, three halves, the minimum solar mass nebula, the famous one. And these ones is just the 100 times scaled down version of the solids here inside. And here you add the ice and you call ice a solid. And that, so you have a, an increase of solids here outside of this line here. So these relations are given here for reference R to the minus three halves for rock inside and for ice three times, uh, four times as much for ice here gives the solids. So this is the distinction here. So outside we have much more solids. That means we can accrete material faster. Okay, because sigma, we remember from today in the morning, we know the accretion rate m, m dot is proportional to sigma, obviously, sigma particle, and this is four times larger in the outer regions than it is inside. Okay, and this is the diagram uh, I've alluded to a few minutes ago. Here we plot the mass in units of Earth masses versus distance for two different uh, curves here. The solid curve is the mass to sustain an envelope with epsilon 0.1, as I've shown before, and the dash curve is the isolation mass. So we can see here, I told you before, the isolation mass must be larger than this mass to sustain an envelope, otherwise we will not have an atmosphere, otherwise we will not have the atmosphere. So we can see here that only outside of this ice line, the uh, isolation mass is larger than the mass to get an atmosphere. So only outside planets can, in, can obtain an atmosphere and plan only outside planet can potentially accrete large amount of gas. The terrestrial planets never reach this situation. They can never, uh, even though there is lots of gas present, they would never be able to accrete it in a reasonable amount of time. Okay? So, so it's small radii, only terrestrial type of planets, no or little atmosphere, large radii, massive planets, and more likely, but the details depend on the actual disk model, of course. This was one example for the minimum solar mass nebula, and you can construct different types of nebulae, and you get different relations here, and also in different phases of evolution of the disk, you get also different values here. <coughs> so, how does this work? If you believe now we have the core accretion scenario, we know planets out there can accrete atmospheres, how does the process itself proceed? There we need to have a few equations, but some of you may have seen them, maybe all of you have seen them. I'll just repeat them for you. These equations are the structural equations for a, a, a planet, the hydrostatic structural equations, and they are identical to the equations of stellar evolution. These are the same equations, so that means we describe the growth of a planet using a sequence of hydrostatic models, basically. There's a little exception here, the S over the T, oops, but this, I can, can come back to that later. This is not in the stellar evolution case, but it's the same with the star. If you want to describe stellar evolution, you do not an evolution in time because the star evolves in five billion years. So what you do is you have a sequence of models, each one hydrostatic, giving you at one instant of time the structure of the star. Then you step forward, and you assume you have an additional production of helium in the center. This changes the equation of state, and that gives you a new structure, and you calculate that. Later on, you have an additional production of silicium, let's say, or whatever, in the, in the center of the star, which gives you again a new structure, and so you go on. And the same thing with the planet. You assume the planet accretes mass, so you change the boundary condition for the planet, and you calculate a new hydrostatic model. So you go from hydrostatic model through hydrostatic model, you step it in forward in time, even though your models are not really time dependent. Okay. This is a very difficult endeavor. I mean, there are models for pl planet formation which that genuinely solve the time dependent hydro equations, but they are very detailed and I think the basic features are captured by these equations very well, and they are the standard up to now still. Only when you have a rapid phase, you may use some time-dependent terms here, like this one, for example. So, meanwhile, you have probably all read this, or not, if you don't know these equations here. Yes, and um, 
These are basically, as I said, mass conservation, hydrostatics here, radiative diffusion proportional to the uh, temperature gradient here, energy generation, this epsilon is the classic energy generation in stars, nuclear energy there, and here it would be the energy deposited by the infalling planetesimals that give you some source of energy here, which gives rise to a luminosity here. And then you have here contractional energy. So the, the planet is contracting here, and this gives PDV work, and this PDV work increases the energy or, vice, or the e entropy, for that matter. And then you have the ideal gas law given here, and these equations are solved to calculate the evolution of a growing planet in the disk. Okay. The problem now is how to find, I mean, these equations are well known, as I told you, from stellar structure and stellar evolution. The problem is how to find the appropriate boundary conditions. So these are differential equations, and as we know from our studies, differential equations can only be solved if we have suitable initial conditions or boundary conditions. Okay? And this is, of course, the main difference here in comparison to stellar evolution. Yes, the boundary conditions make all the difference. Okay? So, boundary conditions. Lots of text. Yes. I don't know what to do, really, <laughs> but I should read it off here from you. So, I mean, you, you first need to have a core, okay? The radius of the core, the, for the core you assume it's there, it has been formed, let's say 10 Earth masses. The core has a constant density, 3 grams per cubic centimeter, let's say. Yes, it probably has more, 5 grams per cubic centimeter, because it's very compact, very massive here. Constant density for the core, so you have our core. You can calculate this from your initial model, this is set. Then you have L-core, the luminosity that comes out of the core. Okay? More difficult, it's assumed that the luminosity comes through the accretion of the planetesimals onto this core. And the planetesimals go, of course, slowly through the envelope, which is there. They dissipate some energy while going through. But you assume in the first order approximation that all the energy is liberated when it reaches the core. All the kinetic energy is set free there, and this gives you the luminosity of the core L core. Additional luminosity from other sources, radiative decay, cooling of the core, core contraction, I've said, and so on. Outer boundary, maybe even more crucial here, outer boundary. Because the planet is embedded in the disk, so we cannot just say, okay, the outer boundary uh, will be set by whatever, some, some conditions. And the outer boundary for stars is also uh, not so easy there. It's, a, it's basically a product of the calculation there for the sun. Okay, so at the outer boundary you specify. You have three different possibilities. The, the planet is attached or embedded still in the nebula. Then you call this, the, then you take the planet envelope and the disk is a continuous transition. Okay, the disk temperature, for example, matches the temperature of the envelope. Or you have a detached version here. That means the planet's envelope is no longer in contact with the disk, so it has been grown too much, or it has opened up a gap yes, in the disk. We will see that. Then there is, it's, there's some separation there. Okay? Or the evolution is such the planet is no longer in a disk. The disk has been dissipated. The planet is just sitting there and still evolves because it's hot. It has just formed. It's hot, but it still evolves then in time. Okay, these are the different boundary conditions. I will explain it to you in a, in a little bit more different here, a uh, little bit more detail here now. Okay, for small masses, which is approximately, approximately 10 to 20 Earth masses, the envelope of the growing planet and the disk out here are in contact, in thermal contact here, so there's the same pressure. The top upper layers of the, of the planet have the same pressure as the ambient disk, and the same temperature here, okay, and then the Luminosity which comes out goes through here and then goes out through the disk and, and leaves the whole system here. So we have T nebula, the autobahn condition, P nebula here, and the planet here. And the radius of this is calculated by a combination here of the Bondi accretion radius, which is basically the radius from the object, sorry, where the sound speed CS equals the escape speed approximately. Okay. The thermal speed of the gas equals the escape speed from the system and the hill radius. Okay. So it's a combination of this and it's usually the, the, the smaller of this radius here which is taken as the radius of the object. 
Okay? And then some geometric interpolation between them. And this is from Christoph Modassini. He has, by the way, very nice lectures on planet formation on the web. And there I got this picture from. So the same here. Okay, for larger masses here, yes, the, the planet contracts, yes, and it's no longer continuously connected to the disk. Yes, the gas accretion is, is by, determined by the nebula then, yes. Okay, and then you have different boundary conditions. Okay, the planet radius is much smaller than the radius of our age, basically. Okay, the temperature and pressure are determined then by a sort of accretion shock of material falling radially into the planet here. It may not be important to know all the details here. The only importance is that at some phase, the planet disconnects. The only important fact to know is that at some place, uh, the planet disconnects from the disk and you change from the continuous boundary conditions basically to a sort of accreting uh, boundary conditions here, where you have radial infall and the energy is liberated here uh, at the surface here, where you have the luminosity from the internal part coming. In addition, the accretion luminosity of this gas, which is collecting on the uh, planet here. Okay. There are, of course, corrections here. Principle. This is by a calculation by Stephen Lubo, for example. If you look at streamlines in the vicinity of the planet, if you do a, a hydrodynamical simulation there, you know the planet is forming in a disk, so the matter must come primarily from the disk. But these hydrostatic models, you may have noticed, they're all spherically symmetric. Okay? These were the spherically symmetric structure equations for a planet. But reality, as we know, is 3D, not 2D. Okay, and this comes in here at one point. So we know that we have accretion from the disk, from a flat disk. So we, we, we could uh, construct some corrections to this accretion formula here and make better boundary conditions here. This is in principle only possible if you have a full evolution here of the disk and the planet at the same time, but this is very difficult. There's only one or two simulations like this, and I will not, I think, come to those in more detail here. Then you could make some corrections to this accretion picture there, but this is basically parameterized in the models, okay? Since there's no real coupled model of disk and planet evolution in 2D or even 3D available. So it can only give a snapshot, if at all. So we can see here's material which comes close here. These are the Lagrange points here again. Comes close here, can be accreted. And this is sort of accretion disk around the planet, the so-called circumplanetary disk, okay? And material goes through there. And the question is then how fast can material move through this disk and be accreted onto the planet? The final phase in this evolution here is given by the state when the disk is basically gone. So we have here the planet here, the outer planet radius. So this is basically like, like an isolated star. So we have now reached the situation where we can basically apply the same conditions as we apply for stellar evolution. Isolated objects, there's still some remnant heat available. The object is slowly cooling off. It's radiating from the surface, losing energy from the surface, and evolves slowly in time over longer time scales. Okay? And in addition, of course, there is some stellar irradiation here onto the planet, which may need to be taken into account. But even now, the internal energy which is emitted by Jupiter at the present moment, now, after five giga years, okay, is three times higher than the irradiation it receives from the sun. Okay? So Jupiter still, even after this long time, cools slowly off. Okay? So this is really a long time scale we are talking about which is, of course, crucial to know this cooling off time if you want to observe young planets and disks, okay? Then you need to know exactly at what time you're observing the planet, not to get the luminosity wrong, okay? But it can, as I said, be a long time scale. Core accretion planetesimals. I think I will not go into this detail here. Nice plot by Christoph Modassini and Willy Benz here, yes. The idea is the, the, these little fragments that, that, don't read this, okay, these little fragments that fall on, on, onto this growing planet are disrupted by tidal forces, just like a little comet is disrupted by tidal forces when it approaches Jupiter. We all know or may remember, some of you may remember Shoemaker-Levy, yes, which is mentioned here. Shoemaker-Levy broke apart even before it reached the surface of Jupiter. 
And these things can happen or happen all the time when this accreting planet gets small material here. Okay, so this material breaks up and they made a little model how uh, this breaks up in certain steps. Yes, Fidi Benz and Christoph, yeah, how this breaks up in, in, in different steps here. And this is that deposits all these little pieces, deposit their kinetic energy at different depths of the object. This is the main reason for this, this model here. Okay, yes. Good. I think I can, can have the little discussion break at this point. You have no partner. If you want, if you want them to break down when they, they are printed up, like the decimals. Sorry? In, in Christoph and Willis' approach, yes. it means that you suppose some velocity or yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 that. So they yes, are I didn't want to the details here. It is quite a difficult. Yeah, so they break up. They get these little pieces here. They deposit little energy here and there. Sure. And then if you have one big blob, has a different. As you know, they work with this for 10 years. Yeah, yeah, I know. They cannot give this. Yeah, we had uh, two minutes. It's amazing what they did there. This little break up things there. I mean, they only have the slide there. It didn't really go through all the details. So, I need to see how many view graphs I still have. Yeah, no, they, they don't have to be a good deal. You question them too much. Yeah. <laughs> It seems to be much longer when I'm standing here and waiting, to be honest. It's much longer than I think. Yeah. Yeah. This is also a, a trick. If you really want people to ask questions, you, wait. you have to wait. And yeah, you have to wait. I wait five seconds and there's no question, then I continue. Yeah. As you know, everybody yeah. does. No. Well, <laughs> you, have to, yeah, you have to get to the point where someone's so uncomfortable with the silence and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's faster sort of 15, 20 seconds. But you need a clock for that. Yeah, 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 yeah. tell them I'm going to wait until I get three questions. So it's been... I need to stop them now. So, do 
we have it? 30 more seconds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, we need to continue. Time is going fast these days. And then we'll have to talk faster, of course. Okay, rapid accretion of gas. So we, if you do these models, which are the stellar evolution models with some suitable boundary conditions, as I've just explained to you. Mitsunu already in 1980 found that, if you do all this, that above a certain critical mass, there is no hydrostatic solution for the envelope possible. Okay? Seems to be a surprise, but if you look at this, there's a simple analytical model, which I will not go through. I had all the, view, the equations there, but I took them out. Uh, you can see this in the book by Phil first and uh, the original derivation of this model by Stevenson, 1982. A simple model analytically going through this, showing that there is no, there's a maximum core mass above which you cannot sustain an envelope, basically, an equilibrium. So then this nice equilibrium sequence of models is problematic. And there, there are some hydrodynamic, time-dependent models available also for this rapid gas accretion there. That's where the application for it is. Okay, and this mass is, this is the most important here on this view graph, by the way, is around 20 Earth masses. And this is the Rosalund mean opacity in units of centimeters squared per gram. Okay. So this is around, so let's say 10 to 20 Earth masses here. And so it depends a lot, as you can see already here, on the opacity. And the opacity, in turn, depends on the amount, as we have heard today, and talking about the disk opacities, it depends on the amount of solids, of course. There. Okay, the more solids you have, the more opacity, the higher the opacity is. And above this critical core mass, there's a contraction, contraction and runaway accretion. Okay, and then we need numerical simulations to follow this. And I will not show these two diagrams, but show qualitatively what the outcome is. Okay, the diagrams give you more detail here. The qualitative solutions are plotted on the right here of the planet mass. First you grow the core, and then there's a long time, and there's slow accretion, hydrostatic accretion of gas, and the core mass slowly increases here, and suddenly the core mass reaches its critical value, and then you have a runaway accretion of gas. Okay. The problem is only how long is this time scale here. Okay. So the core formation time, this was short, given the, uh, the isolation mass there and the increase in isolation mass to the ice. We can shorten it below 10 to the 6 year, 10 1 million years. The hydrostatic phase is some 10 to the 6 year. And this sum contains huge variations. It can be between 2 and 15 million years or so. Yes. And this is a problem already. Okay, and the mass then, then we have rapid accretion, and this runaway is of course uh, much shorter, less than 100,000 years, so this is short. So when, once we have reached the phase, we can do very fast gas accretion there. And this time scale depends on a lot of factors here. Opacity, convection, energy transport in the, in the envelope, chemical composition, mass accretion rate, then we have 2D, 3D models accretion, migration through the disk, so you see, if a planet moves through the disk, there's new material the planet can accrete, so it experiences different uh, uh, boundary conditions from the disk, so you can change this time scale here. Okay? I will not go into the details here. This is still, I think, under development, even though lots of progress has been made, but I don't know all the information here that I could possibly give you. You can look into the previous two slides where they sh I show you some of this. I will just uh, mention a few points here. Okay? This diagram by, by Greg Laughlin here on the right-hand side, taken from these, some of these type of models here. Here have the time in mega years to reach this point where runaway gas accretion sets in. Okay? And on the x-axis, you have here the surface density of solids in the disk. You need 
for a certain time here. This goes, of course, through the opacity, basically. Okay? So if the solids here have something like 10 grams per cc here, you need 2 million years. If you have less here, you need near to 10 million years. So a variation of only a factor of few here leads already to a large variation in these time scales. That is the problem. Okay? So you need basically a huge info, a huge amount of polyps, solids here. Yes, and this time scale, the problem is even worse if you go out to Neptune and Uranus mass planets out there. Yes, then you are further out, and we have seen the growth time of the core gets slower and slower. Yeah, proportion r to the minus three halves, or, or even more. So you get get longer and longer time scales there, and basically you cannot produce let's say, uh, the course in typical time scales there in those distances here. Not to talk about, let's say, the uh, directly imaged planets at 50 AU or so. They have big time problems if you want to form them by this, this way. So there's a way out, pebble accretion or a rearrangement of planets, like in the Nice model for the solar system I will talk about in Lecture 8. Okay? But the pebble accretion I will briefly mention if time allows. Yeah, it's, it's here. So, pebble accretion. How can you possibly shorten this time scale here, which may uh, be too long for producing these, for reaching the state of rapid atmosphere accretion? So, this comes back to the discussion we had today in the morning a little bit about Hill sphere and, and, and enhancement, gravitational enhancement factor, and so on. So, this is a plot from uh, Anders Johansen here. It goes back to a paper, Anders Lambrechts and Johansson, 2012. I forgot the number here, 2012, okay? Here is the growing planet in the middle of this little dot here. Green is the gravitational radius. This is the radius leading to the gravitational cross-section, which I have talked about today. Red is the Hill sphere. So, a planetesimal goes in here, and quite often it goes out. We have seen today in the morning very complicated, let's say, uh, uh, motions here. The planetesimal, the idea is, is not affected too much by the gas which is present there. Of course, it feels the gas, but the gas drag is not so large. So it basically can move into the Hill sphere and leave the Hill sphere again. It's not accreted necessarily by the planet. It depends, of course, on the energy loss it experiences. The planetesimal experiences when it's moving into the vicinity of the planet, but it can nevertheless leave it again and, and not be accreted. This is this dashed curve here. Planet this is means here, I guess you cannot read it in the back, I tell you, planetesimal is scattered by protoplanet. Duck. Pebble spirals towards protoplanet due to gas friction. This is this text here. Okay. For pebbles, the situation is different. Pebbles is a sort of DC meter sized object, and the gas drag is highest, largest in that, uh, let's say, size range. Okay. So it experiences, experiences a lot of gas drag. And that means it will spiral cluck here to the inner part and be accreted. Okay. And this will help to, if you have enough pebbles still available. This will help you, this is the main problem here, this will help you to uh, increase the accretion rate. And now we define this here, this is, we define alpha p to distinguish it from the alpha disk of fill. Alpha p is the radius of the planet divided by the hill radius, which is much smaller than one initially, much smaller than one, okay? No, pebble is decimeter sized. This is a pebble. I mean, if you look up pebble, I think, in Wikipedia, yes, or sand and pebble and so on, there are lots of definitions wherever you are. I mean, there's Pebble Beach in California. I don't know what the, what the size of the pebbles is there. I think it's like this, yeah, not really a decimeter. Yeah, then you go to Nice. Nice in France has also Pebble Beach, yeah, sort of. They are also this size. But here we call pebbles decimeter size objects. Comets are a little bit bigger. Comet would be small planetesimal. Okay, so pebbles feel the gas drag and slow them down, they spiral in, and then we can calculate a new cross-section, basically here we have the cross-section for, planetesim for planetesimal accretion, which was basically Rp squared times F graph, so we have a, a large reduction here in this cross-section here, and when we have pebble accretion, this factor alpha here disappears, and we have a strong enhancement here by a factor of 500 to 1,000 in the possible mass accretion rate. 
this is the point. So you can really, in, as, as long as you have enough pebbles available there, you can accrete them very rapidly. And this leads to a mass accretion rate m dot proportional to m to the power of 2 in the best circumstances. Okay, very rapid. Okay. And this we can draw, we can draw a diagram here, pebble accretion. So this is the time scale here in years, and this is the uh, core mass in, 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 um, in units of the earth mass here. So we can see when do we reach here 10 earth masses. This would be the uh, regime we need to reach to get critical, uh, the critical core mass to continue from there with the rapid gas accretion. Okay. So we can see here in the dashed curves here are the curves if we just have regular planetesimal accretion. And we can see here at 5 AU, for example, we need here something around 10 to the 6 years to get the core to 10 Earth masses, okay? which is the standard value, basically, sort of. Yeah? 5 AU, this is the one here. Then we have 5 AU in other curve here. This is more complicated. There's some index here. The longer times is 3D estimate, the shorter times 2D estimate. Yeah, it depends from where you accrete the pebbles or the planetesimals, where they have uh, let's say, them condensed already in the midplane, or whether you have them still further spread in, in, in altitude already, that varies uh, the time scale a little bit. But if you do pebble accretion here, you can see here that the time scales are reduced substantially. You can even, at 50 AU, you can reach the critical commas within, within time scale shorter than one million year. And that is, in principle, this is amazing. Yes. Yeah, if this is possible. So the claim of Anne Lambrecht and Johansson is, yes, this is a very good idea. Yes, you can accrete lots of pebbles, you can shorten the lifetime, you can easily make Uranus and Neptune, and you can easily make planets which are at 20, 30, 40 AU distance. Okay. The question then is, how well, how much, how many, how many pebbles are still available? Yes. And this is now, I think, presently, this paper is from 2012 here. This is still, this is now under active research. Yes, and it depends on the flow here, whether you have a 2D flow or a 3D flow. 2D means you have all the material basically in the considered in the midplane, and then you, it leads to higher accretion rates, obviously, because the density is, is really very, very high in the midplane. Yes, and, they, and these objects are still small, so they're deeply embedded in the disk, so anything which, which is above the, above the midplane will not be accreted, but everything which is, which is in the midplane will be accreted here. Okay, the details in red need to be worked out, so this is just the initial state, basically, of this. The final mass, yeah, I need to say something about this, a few more minutes. The final mass, so if there's lots of gas available in the disk, we would expect these planets can grow indefinitely. Okay, they just can accrete and accrete and accrete, and we get 10, 20 Jupiter masses. And the point is, at the formation region of Jupiter, probably we don't know exactly because we haven't seen the solar nebula there. There would have, there were, might have been more mass available, so Jupiter could have grown bigger if it had wanted to. Okay, so what limits the growth of a planet? So here we have a little, a little planet. A hill is smaller than H disk, and and Phil, I don't know, is this? Anyhow, the, the planet is smaller than the hill radius. In this case, this is the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, um, the size of the planet here. I'm confused now here, yeah, okay. The, the hill radius is smaller than the vertical thickness of the disk here. And then the disk is not influenced, so we have the regular growth that we have uh, described here. And for large planet masses, the hill radius exceeds the disk thickness here, and it begins to stick out of the disk. And then in a, that, such circumstances, the disk will be truncated here, and we will have uh, a shutoff of the growth here. Okay. Good. <clears throat> So how can we explain this gap formation here? Okay. It's not directly by the accretion of material onto the planet. So we could imagine, okay, the planet grows here, takes out material from this region of the disk, and so a gap will be formed because there's no more material available. 
This is not true for a gas disk because a gas disk will continuously supply new material to the location of the planet, so we will continue the accretion. It's not like the isolation mass suddenly, you know, particles behave differently here than gas, so you have a gas pressure, so we will always have material coming back, coming new, new material will be coming there. So the accretion material is not really the reason there, it's mainly because of angular momentum transfer by the planet to the disk. Okay? The, the planet disturbs the disk, and gives angular momentum to the disk, which leads to an angular momentum change in the disk, and it, it recedes from the planet, basically. You can do two approximations here, the so-called impulse approximation or the hydrodynamic approximation. I will say more about this uh, tomorrow, then. And the width of this gap is determined by gravity, viscosity, and gas pressure. So I need now to show, I think, one nice plot from a book I bought today, okay. Pat Casson, 2003, in SASFE Advanced Course 31, April 2001, okay. Very nice, I just got it today, and here there's a plot already, so very easy. Okay, so it, these are interesting books that are out there, little advertisement section, yeah. And, and the, how does it work? So don't look too detailed at the equations now, you can read it here in the book here. How does it work, this process? You have a little particle here on some radius distance delta r from the planet. This is the growing planet, which wants to open up the gap, okay? Particles move by here on this orbit, for example, and if they were not disturbed by the planet, they would move here on this line here, okay? The planet moves on this line. These are the Keplerian orbits here. But this gravity here disturbs the motion, and this object is deflected by an angle delta. Okay, this you can calculate by pure two-body dynamics, Keplerian motion here, it's a hyperbolic orbit, you can calculate from the velocity difference here. See, this is Kepler, this is Kepler. We know the velocity difference, we know the relative velocity, we know the impact parameter. These formula are everywhere available. This is Kepler, okay? So you can calculate the deflection angle. The deflected particle has then suddenly a little change in this Kepler velocity here because it was deflected. The V5 velocity has changed. And if you change the V5 velocity, this implies there's a change in angular momentum of the particle. So the particle has, when it, after it has passed the planet, has a different angular momentum than it had before. So the planet has given angular momentum to the particle. Okay? And then the next round, the particle comes back and gets a new kick. Okay? And it accumulates little kicks and you integrate all the angular momentum given by the planet to the particle and sum it all up, and then you get the angular momentum deposition by the planet onto the, on, onto the disk, which is done here, and here is the final formula. Okay? This J dot is the angular momentum transfer by the planet onto the disk of particles here. I mean, the disk is not really a particle, uh, collection of particles, but the disk has gas, pressure, in fact, yes, and so different effects. But this is a first-order approximation, which is very good. Yes, it's, I think it's laid out in a, in a PP3 paper by Doug Lin and, and John Papaloza, if I remember correctly. Yes, so it's laid out in great detail here, but all these relations here are very, very similar here. And then you equate this J dot to the viscous transport of angular momentum, as we have seen it today or yesterday. Yes, in the disk, m dot disk times the specific angular momentum at the location of the planet. This is this equation, yes. And this is j dot, is j dot graph. You equate this and you see under what conditions the planet can open up a gap in the disk, okay. Which is very nice, okay. Good. And if you do a numerical simulation, I will show you this here. This will be the last thing I say today. You can see this here. You have a Jupiter mass planet here. It creates spiral arms. So we'll come back to that tomorrow. And at the same time, if the evolution goes on, this, so this planet does not accrete any material here. It's just sitting there. We are in the co-rotating frame. And then we have the Lagrange, the Trojans here, so the density becomes lower and lower. Blue is low density, red is high density. The density becomes lower and lower at the location of the planet until we have a full-fledged gap formed at the end, basically. 
Okay, and then it begins newly. Okay, so the planet opens up a gap because of angular momentum transfer from the planet to the disk. So the outer disk gains angular momentum and the inner disk loses angular momentum. And gaining angular momentum means you move to out to further away from the planet and losing angular momentum means you move further inward from the planet. So the material is really receding from the location from the planet, pushed away, loosely speaking. It's pushed away from the location of the planet by the transfer of angular momentum from the planet to the disk. This formula is mentioned tomorrow again. You also don't need to copy it. I will come back to this tomorrow. Okay, so this is the criterion for gap formation. And surprisingly enough, for the solar system, planets of, of Saturn and Jupiter masses open up gaps. And that was very good explanation why we have Jupiter in the solar system. There was a nice gap open, Jupiter did not accrete anymore, and that was the whole story. <laughs>